We will be completing lesson seven today, which is basically how to measure how fast an output changes. So you'll know that you're successful if you can understand the meaning of the term average rate of change. And when given a graph of a function, you can estimate or calculate the average rate of change between two points. I'm recording right now. We'll link it in the slides just like always. Um, sometimes I put helpful videos from last year if I caught it differently, um, or I'll go back and if I help people in tutoring and I happen to record it, or if I help people on the practice in my math lab and I happen to record it, I'll just like throw it into one of the slides. So I know for the lesson five puzzle piece, if you had trouble with that, if you go back to Wednesday when we finish that lesson, you can see like an additional video to help you with that practice if you need it. Um, so just always use Schoology as a resource or whatever particular lesson you're struggling with. Um, the puzzle piece today will be lesson seven. You should have some time to work on it in class. And then here are all the deadlines for the rest of the semester. And I even included like our final exam in there too. So we have one more unit test, then finals after that. And really like there's not a whole lot of time in this semester. It might seem like, okay, like December 19th is a month away, but one of those weeks you're off. So really use maybe this coming week to get ahead, to maybe go back and do old study guides if you plan to retake, because you're not gonna see big moves in your grade, like if you have a low grade, unless you're coming in and doing those retakes. So um, if you need like more guidance on how to figure out what you need to do, let me know. But it's, it's mostly just retaking the test. So I forget what I wanted to show you. I think it was this. So in this week's folder, um, you know, we only got through lesson seven this week, but I do have the next three puzzle pieces in there. And I do have some students coming to me and saying, look, Miss Medina, I got an eight out of 10 and we haven't even done that lesson yet. So like, you're more than welcome to go ahead. I'm sure some of the stuff you've seen before, or you could quickly like find a YouTube video by just typing in the title of that lesson in, in YouTube. Like literally, there's teachers out there that make five minute videos all the time. So if you're ever wanting like someone else to explain it to you, maybe you don't understand what I'm saying ever, find something on YouTube because like there's plenty of options there especially for average rate of change, which we're doing today, but all the other stuff in there too, um, if you want to get ahead. So just some options. Now back to the warm up. Um, we already read it. So basically we're determining who is correct based on the average rate of change. So the reporter today, and I don't want you to take like a million years to figure it out. But the reporter today will be whoever in your group is the shortest. Right. Like 10 seconds, take it up. Don't take too long to figure this out. It looks like Aubrey's. Okay. All right, moving on and bring it back. You don't even know what table I'm calling on, but really, you all should have discussed by now. You all should have heard the answer. Okay. Um, so let's go with table six. Where's my All right, table six. My reporter. Who do you think is correct, Tyler or May? Why May? Okay, so what did it drop by from here to here? Five. Okay, so it went down by nine. Um, so maybe because 
get dropped anymore. Any teams out there pick Tyler? Okay, um, so Wrigley's team, whoever the reporter is, why did you pick Tyler? All right, so Tyler, because it dropped how much degrees? Eight degrees in two hours. How many hours was it for like May's observation? Okay, so hers was four hours and it was um, nine degrees that it went down. So the question was, or they were saying that it dropped faster. Now, the book doesn't want me to like necessarily tell you the answer. It wants me to like keep going and then come back to this, but I think this would be a good one to model. So here's how you can tell. So I'm gonna kind of pause and come back to this. This definition is not printed on your paper, but maybe star it, highlight it. You don't have to write it word for word, but average rate of change has a particular formula. Here it is. So you don't have to write everything. In fact, it kind of is confusing when it's in function notation, in my opinion. But write this average rate of change and this formula. So what this formula is saying that if I take the output of each function and subtract them, then I divide them by the inputs of the function and subtract those, that that'll be my average rate of change. So looking at that formula, does that look familiar to anyone? Yes. What does it look like? Well, yes, it does have function notation. Anyone take like conceptual physics? I had some people in my first hour talk about that. Oh, maybe. I don't know the formula for force. What's the formula for force? Okay, so maybe it might look like that. But I'm thinking of a different formula. Maybe if I write it like this. So f of x like equals what normally? F of x equals what? Y. So when I have like f of b, that's a y minus a y of a different function. So we're going to label them differently. Then divide it by what's in the parentheses usually for function notation, the input. So divided by the input of this output minus the input of that output. Does this look more familiar? Yeah. What does it look like? It is. It's the formula for slope. If you've ever used that before, like for linear functions, we just called it the slope formula but it's also the average rate of change formula. All right, the difference is if it's not a linear function, so like this one is not linear, it's curvy. The only difference is now in the problem, you need to look for what two inputs it's asking you to look for. So like in this problem, I have no clue what this would be of, but maybe it's saying that this is one, two, three, four, I don't know. It might want the average change, rate of change between x equals one and x equals four. Or it might want it from like x equals one and x equals two. It just depends on what the problem is. All right, but either way, you take the coordinates and make one of them x1, y1, the other one x1 or x2, y2, and then plug it into that formula. Okay, so remember that formula. Everyone have it written down. That's your average rate of change formula. Also known as slope. 
So then going back to our warm up, let's actually truly determine who is correct. So for Tyler, I'll leave his in red. He looked at between 4 and 6 p.m. Make those coordinates. So the four input has what output? 25. The six input has what output? So just make one of them x1, y1. It doesn't matter which one. The other x2, y2. And plug it into that formula we talked about. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So what are we saying that y2 is? 17 minus y1, which is over x2, which is minus x1, which is four. I would not skip this step. I know you guys might think like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna take a shortcut, not right, not label it, but like there's tons of silly mistakes out there. You so then on the top with 17 minus 25. On the bottom, what's six minus four? And if you can simplify that, do. What's negative eight divided by two? Okay, so the average rate of change for four to 6 p.m. was negative four. So it dropped about negative four per hour because it's technically negative four over one. Now let's compare that to May. So May's coordinates I'll do in blue. She's looking at the six to 10 time frame. So what's the output for six? What's the output for 10? Now, again, same thing. This time I'll try to use like different colors so you can really see it. So X1, Y1 and the other x2, y2, and plug it in. So now in this one, we said y2 is 8 minus y1, which is good, divided by x2, which is minus x1, which is And then just simplify. What's eight minus seventeen? Negative nine over ten minus six, which is now it's hard to compare like a whole number to a fraction. So let's actually make that a decimal. It's not four point five. So two point two five. Negative two point two five. At least that's what I remember it from earlier. Someone can correct me. So average rate of change for that one is negative 2.25. So really, which who was correct? Tyler or May? Tyler. Because that one changed faster per hour compared to May. And really, like, I know technically the greater number, listen, is the negative 2.25, but that's just showing that it dropped. Like, the negative is just showing that it dropped by that much. The negative 4 per hour is still greater, if that makes sense. Questions? All right, so then scrolling down. So really, um, Tyler was the one who is correct. And you can prove it algebraically. So same situation, except more data. And this is actually on your paper now. So the table and graphs show a more complete picture of the temperature changes on the same winter day. The function T gives the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit eight hours since noon. So pretend like you aren't looking at this, like that it doesn't actually tell you. Between hours and temperature, what depends on what? Is it that the temperature determines what time it is or that the time determines the temperature? 
Good. So even if this wasn't already given to you, you should be able to know that our, since it's independent, is your S, and that the temperature, since it's dependent, is your Y. Okay? Now, you guys will find the average rate of change for these intervals. So you have about three to four people in your group. Feel free to like split it up and then just kind of check each other. Um, same formula as before. What's the average rate of change formula? Perfect. So change in your output divided by the change in your input. But read closely. First of all, do we know when you did? Um, and then do we know when midnight is? Now, look at your graph. The X is hour since noon. So pay attention to that. So at the zero, what time is that? How many hours since noon? So like at this part of the graph, at the zero, for zero hours since noon, what time is it? 12, 12 p.m., right? Um, 1 p.m. is how many hours since noon? So it would be here on the graph, and that's what this is telling you. So it would be 1 p.m. So, okay, so just make sure we read it correctly. Because I would probably look at this and think hours since midnight, because it was like, Military time and stuff, but no, that's not how we're doing it. Hours to the noon. So keep that in mind. Find the average rate of change in your group. I'll give you five minutes. All right. So let's see. Can, um, okay. Whoever was the reporter last time, go like one to the left. Now that's the new reporter. Okay. <laughs> So table seven. Table seven. All right, stop talking. So table seven. For the average rate of change between noon and one, what did you put? One. Okay, one. Anyone get something different? Anyone get negative one? Okay. Um. So then, seems like we have a consensus there. It is one, a positive one. Um. And here's how, just in case someone out there is freaking out because they don't know how to do it and they know you're calling it. So. For the coordinate for noon, which one is it? Um, okay, I'll pick table by table if no one's answering. Table eight. For noon, what coordinate is it from the table? You guys, right? What coordinate on the table is for noon? <laughs> Hold on, there's too much talking going on. I'm literally talking to one person right here. Peyton, sorry. Um, so H represents what? Okay, so which one would be for noon exactly? Okay. Zero eighteen, good. Which one would be for one p.m.? Let him. Sorry, which one? I didn't hear. You. Which number would represent one p.m. if if this numbers are hours since noon? Oh, yeah. Yes. So, um, guys, stop talking. Okay, one and what? Uh, Good. So this one's for noon, this one's for 1 p.m. 
Pick one of them to be your X1, Y1. It does not matter which. And the other one to be X2, Y2. So then when you put it together, it looks something like this. 19 minus 18 over 1 minus 0. 19 minus 18 is 1 minus 0 is divide that we get what um earlier i think some people got a negative did they flinch one of these because they flipped one of them you have to keep it consistent like that's why i say don't skip the labeling you could have decided to label the top one x2 y2 and so forth and got something like this so 18 minus 19 over zero minus one. But like when you subtract that out, 18 minus 19 is negative one, zero minus one is negative one. Doesn't that still make a positive? So either way would have worked as long as you're not flip flopping them in between. Um, different table, table three, between noon and 4 p.m., what's the rate of change? 1.75. Anyone get something different? Okay, then we won't go over that one if you didn't get something different. Um, it is 1.75. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead. All right, table five. What about between noon and midnight? What's the rate of change for between noon and midnight? If you answered, I didn't hear it. So you're gonna have to speak up. So one C is the one that we're doing between noon and midnight. What was the average rate of change that you got? Be confident. Give me the decimal version of it. Okay, anyone get something different than that? So let's see. Um, you could also do this in a calculator, but I also want you to know how to do things without a calculator because some of you show up to the test without a charged Chromebook and all of that stuff. So here's how to do it without a calculator. This will minimize. All right, so the coordinate for noon, we already know what's the coordinate for noon. 0, 18, so let's not skip the labeling step. So 1C, I'll do the work down here. Um, so that's for noon. What coordinate is for midnight, Anthony? What coordinate is for midnight? 12, 7. Now, these are my coordinates. Pick one of them to be x1, y1, the other to be x2, y2. It doesn't matter. But now you just plug it in. You could plug it into Desmos and let Desmos do it for you, but you have to know the formula and how to label it. I do not provide formulas on tests because that is not how it is when you take your state testing or when you do um, your ACT and SAT. So got to prepare you for the real world. All right, but yeah, it is negative 0.9. So they are correct. It looks weird, I agree, but that's the correct answer. Um, in fraction form, this is probably what it looked like. And then you divide it out, this is what you get. Now, it didn't say what to round to, but you that's usually something that's also assessed on like any test. So know your rounding rules. 
if I want to round it to the tenths place, what's my answer for this? Nope, that would be to the whole number if you're saying negative one. What if I need to round to the tenths with the TH at the end? How many spaces after the decimal is it for the tenth place? One space actually after the decimal. So then remember your rounding rules. Whenever you're rounding, what number do you look at? The one to the left or the one to the right? If that number is zero through what, it stays the same? Good. Feel free to write this down too, because I know some people need this. Um, and then if it's five through what, it goes up one. Five through nine. So then, yeah, look at the number to the right. Since it's the one, that, that point 0.9 is going to stay the same. So it would be this rounded correctly with this kind of plot. What about to the hundredth with a th? Two spots after the decimal, what would the answer be? Negative 0.92 is correct. So again, hundred spot is here. Look to the right, since that's a six, you round up. Making sense? What about the thousand with the TH? Three spots after the decimal. So what would the answer be then? Negative point nine one, and then look to the right of the one. Will that be a six or a seven? Seven. Okay, so tens, hundreds, and thousands. What about if you wanted it to go one spot? What would my answer be? Negative one. That would be the whole number spot. Okay, just making sure we understand that. We're almost finished. Um, just want to show you the last one. We're not even really going to do it together unless you want to. All right, so look at this on the back of your paper, because what we did was from a table. It also had a graph too, but we really didn't use the graph since the table um, had all the information nicely. But sometimes it looks like this. And you just have to know what the problem's asking for as far as what points to hit. So like if it says estimate the average rate of change between 1970 and 2010, well, guess what? On the x-axis, we're gonna look at. And, and 2010. So it's between these two x values, Whatever coordinates touch that line, so for California, it touches here and here. For Texas, it touches here and here. All right, you calculate the coordinates that are there, if that makes sense. So like for this blue one right here, the X is what? 1970, what's the Y? Good, that, so then make that x1, y1 if you want. The other one, what's this coordinate? This one? 2010. 2010, and then what's the y about approximately? 38, 37, you have to estimate there. But yeah, it's definitely past like the 35, it's not halfway between, um, and it's not 40 either. So. Yeah, that's a good approximation. And then make that x2, y2, and then that's your average rate of change. We're not actually going to do it unless you want to, but that's how you would figure that out. And then for Texas, you do the same. Look at what x values we want you to look at, find out what the coordinates are, calculate the average rate of change that way. Um, so like these graphs, 
this is not a consistent pattern like our linear function, the average rate of change from here to here might be bigger than, say, if you were looking from here to here. Sometimes you can see that just visually and not even have to do the math because clearly, like, it did not change much from here to here versus from here to here, right? So it's steeper here, definitely more change. Um, but to really know for sure, you have, you would have to calculate. So questions on that? Okay, I'm just showing you it. I don't know that we need to do it. If you want to, we can. Um, I'd rather give you time to practice. So the puzzle piece is lesson seven but really all of them should be done up to seven so if you have questions on any of them let me know you're in group so that you can help each other try like working on the same problem together if you disagree ask me and all the things